We were just talking about you. We were trying to decide if I should mark you tardy or absent, so I just marked you tardy. And that seemed like that was a good call. So uh, on the screen here before you, you'll notice that we're starting a new chapter. We have moved past that of logarithms. Now we're going to move into some applications. Uh, one might say just I don't random is not the right word, but just some some a hodgepodge of topics to end our year. Some things that you will discuss in geometry next year. And uh, so we're going to get started today with these uh, two warm up questions. Nick. Uh, no, I'm just moving on forward. Now, as you work these out, you'll notice on number one uh, that is some review of radicals. These two, uh, number one, uh, part A and B, these two questions are par for the course for next year. You are expected to come in starting in August knowing how to do questions like uh, number one, part A and B. So if you feel like you're a little deficient, you got to brush up on that. That's fine. We can practice. Uh, but those are two questions with which you should be very comfortable at this point. Number two, solving a couple quadratic equations, also standard operating procedure for a geometry student. OK, being able to solve equations, being able to simplify expressions. That's the name of the game coming out of Algebra 1. So uh, take you some time, do it right, and then we'll discuss. Oh, right now, please. And if you hustle, you'll be in time for our discussion on these. Is that lacrosse season officially over now? No. Why does my schedule not have any more games? JV season's over, but March is still the playoff game. Playoffs, okay. Good deal. We beat up on MUS, so I guess we're moving on down the road. Is it a home game? Uh, I hope it is. Macaulay's all the way over there in Chattanooga. It'll be a long drive. One time my dad woke up at like 5 in the morning, drove six hours straight to get to uh, a 12 o'clock baseball game in Chattanooga for me. And then after the baseball game was over at 2.30, he drove all the way back home, six more hours. Good grief, Dad. Now, these are also some very good exam questions. Hint, hint, wink, wink. So as you get closer to y'all's exam time in what, three weeks? Something like that. As you get closer to your exam week, uh, doing review, periodic review like this is, is a great idea. It is not too early to start studying for your exams. And I use the word plurally because you are going to need to study not just for your math exam, obviously, but for all of your exams. You, you, you get your brother Mark exam, some of you guys in his class. You got your uh, Mr. Niggle exam, some of you guys in his class. Study a little bit for each exam uh, early, and you'll feel so much better. I promise you, you'll feel better. You'll go into the exam feeling more well prepared and less stressed. Well, 
take two more minutes on these. <laughs> well earned then that belt is well earned I punched a kid in the face one time and had to do 30 push ups really? well he was sassing off to me in the classroom Wait, were you the teacher? <laughs> no, I'm kidding I was a, in 8th grade PE class <laughs> no I didn't punch a student in the face they, now, they might have back in like the 60s or 70s. My dad, we told like the nuns. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Gone by a long ago practice. I, I abused my son this weekend, uh, sadly. <laughs> Um, he, Betsy, found a pine cone that she really liked, and so Teddy picked it up and was like, here you go, Betsy, and acted like he was going to hand it to her, and she went to reach for it, and he dropped it right before it got to her hand, and he stomped on it. No, Jacob Alfred, no clapping. That's a rude older brother thing to do. And so I walked up to him, and I said, son, that was not cool. I do not appreciate that. You're going to go apologize to your sister. And I put my leg behind his leg and I pushed him down to where he fell on his back on the ground. And I stood over him. I was like, how does it feel to get bullied? He was like, not good. I said, that's how your sister feels. Now go apologize. <laughs> my grandmother was watching the whole thing and she just nodded her head like that, a boy. Set him straight. I feel like I should just let my kids like fight it out. No, you should not let your kids have fights. You know, like a ring in your house. Like, 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 boxing like, gloves. They're like, like an MMA, though, so it's like more, like, you need whatever you got. It's fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, actually, brass knuckles make it worse. All right, Luke, that's enough. No, we cannot have a bare knuckle or brass knuckle fight with our children. That's a, that's child abuse. <laughs> I know. It was a soft backyard with, with thick grass, and he didn't get hurt. I think it was more of an embarrassment factor than anything else. Sometimes a good embarrassment can serve uh, where a good whooping might not. <laughs> if ifs and buts were candies and nuts, every day would be a party. All right, uh, let's start with the 72 Jackson Pollard. What do you like about 72? Ha ha! So I can split it up. It's 36 times 2. That's fabulous. Now, a lot of people do 8 and 9. What's the problem with 8 and 9, Ashton? Yeah, very good. Well said. 8 and 9 is fine because 9 is a perfect square, just like Jackson said 36 is a perfect square. But 8 has a perfect square of 4 in it. 4 times 9 is 36. So 36 times 2 is the more efficient way of doing that. JT, how do I split up my x cubed? Uh, x squared. Good. Similarly, uh, x cubed is not a perfect square. I like how Jackson phrased that. It's not a perfect square, but it's almost uh, we could take out a perfect square. All right, so of those four, two of them are going to simplify. Two are not. Hogan, simplify the ones that we can. Mm -hmm. So I like this one. Does is two a perfect square? No. No, it's prime. So I can't do anything else to two. What about x squared? Can I take the square root of x squared? Yeah. What's the square root of x squared going to leave me with? Just x. Now I would normally say absolute value of x, but remember, because there's going to be that. Uh, that residue, uh, I guess you could say that X that's left over on the inside, our implied domain restriction is, is locking that down to X has to be greater than zero, greater than uh, or equal to zero anyway, so I don't need absolute value 
right there. So good, this one's 6x times the square root of 2x. All right, that's number one. Check yourself. Make sure you can simplify a radical. Uh, number two, Colton is going to tell us what's the problem with number two, how it's written up. It is bad form to have a square root in the denominator. So cash, we're going to multiply by a clever form of a clever form of a clever form of what? Of one, a clever form of one. Now, uh, let's see here. How about three over three class? Does three over three work? No. Does, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, what about uh, five over five? Should I multiply by five over five? No. Well, those are both clever forms of one, but they don't get the job done. Santiago, which clever form of one does get the job done? Negative one. Uh, negative one. Ashton? Square root of 10 over square root of 10. Okay. When we multiply fractions, we multiply the top with the top and the bottom with the bottom. Now, the top times the top is just going to be 5 radical 10. Justin, what is the bottom times the bottom? Square root of 10 times square root of 10 is what? Which we know to be? Mm-hmm. So we got no more radical. If we multiply by square root of 10 on bottom, square root of 10 on bottom, we get square root of 100, which is just 10. Now, Will Perone, I don't want to leave my fraction looking like that, so what's my last step? Reduce the 5 and the 10 and make it square root of 10 over 2. Beautiful. Square root of 10 over 2. Warning, trick question. Warning, trick question. Hey, Luke, uh, I see a 10 on the top and a 2 on the bottom. I need to simplify that out, right? Okay, good save. Good save. <laughs> that, was, that was real smooth right there, Luke. <laughs> um, you you might think, oh, look, 10 over 2. I'll simplify that out. Wrong, because the square root sign sort of locks that 10 in place, and we can't uh, go upon that and operate. Uh, we just got to leave it as square root of 10 over 2, or 0. 0.5 times square root of 10, or 1 half times square root of 10. So, uh, Simplifying out radicals, fellas, something we spent a lot of time talking about. We talked about how you can split up a radical and make it a product of several things and, and cherry pick the simplifying out factors. And then we talked about how to get it into good form by multiplying a clever form of one, in this case, square root of 10 over square root of 10. All right, questions on number one. All right, now that was a, a good little 10 minutes that we just spent kind of thinking about some review topics. If you do, if you do that every day, for the next two or three weeks, just pick a random topic or go through a list. Go back through your grade book and find all those quizzes that you stunk it up on. And if you said, man, I made a four out of 10 on that one, then practice that quiz again, okay? Look back through your notes and find examples like that and spend 10 minutes a night. And then go, go on to your next thing. Do your next homework assignment. That's an extra 10 minutes a night. Uh, sometimes even a five minutes will help, but you'll do better on your exam as a result. Now, uh, Joseph, we've got number two, part A is what kind of equation? And how many solutions? Two solutions to a quadratic equation. There are four techniques that we've discussed, Quinn Page, for solving quadratics. Can you name them all? You're thinking systems of equations, uh, quadratic equations. Graphing we could solve out. Okay, so we call that completing the square and the square root method. And the last one is actually what you probably did on this example, which is more generally speaking, factoring in the ZPP. Okay, good. We will not actually use magic method on this one, uh, but we want to get X squared minus 10 X minus six equal to zero. I said equal zero. There you go. Uh, and then we want to try and factor it out. Now, are there two factors of negative six that add up to negative 10? No. So although we tried factoring, which I would always encourage you to try factoring first, this one does not factor because I can't say one times six or two times three to equal negative 10. 
So I need that quadratic formula, and I'm hoping that Jacob Alperin, while Nick Pesci buttons his collar, I'm hoping that Jacob Alperin can tell me what that quadratic formula is. I'll write it up here in red real quick. Nope, uh, generalize. Beautiful. Every stinking one of us in this room ought to be able to quote that. X equals the opposite of B plus or minus square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Now that depends, up, or rather, uh, the solution is going to depend on what we call our A, B, and C values. All right, William Kreitz, what is A for this example? Good, when we don't see it, it's an implied one, so A equals one. Uh, William Bryan, what is B in this example? Beautiful, B equals negative 10. And then we're up to Hogan. Hogan, what is C in this example? C equals negative six. So can I plug and chug and simplify up? I sure hope so. All right, so the opposite of B is 10. So X equals 10 plus or minus square root of 10 squared is 100. All right, uh, let's see here. Minus four times one. I always write this part out. So minus four times one times negative six all over two times one. All right, and let's see if we can simplify that out now. By the way, uh, Wilson, what do I call the number that's inside the square root? What do I call the radicand of my quadratic formula? Starts with a D. Oh, that's awful. That is absolutely. That's coming right out the window. Ugh. What's it called? No, it's a Oh, oh yeah, I, I left my tea steeping and then I started teaching my eighth graders and I completely forgot about it. So it steeped for like 50 minutes, which completely ruined it. Ugh. Great, help him out. He's, he's floundering. The discriminant. Now, uh, real quick, the discriminant tells me about the number and the nature of the roots. If the discriminant's positive, I've got two distinct real roots. If that discriminant is a positive perfect squared, those roots will be rational. If that discriminant is uh, a positive and not a perfect square, it will be two irrational real roots. Oh, heck yeah. You're very welcome. Uh, if that discriminant is negative, I've got two imaginary or complex roots, one might say. If that discriminant equals zero, I've got a repeated real root. So it's the same number just repeated a couple times. So let's see here. We got negative four times one times negative six. That's 24. So 124. Uh, is that a perfect square? So my two roots are going to be irrational. OK, in other words, the square root is going to stay in there. So I got 10 plus or minus the square root of 124. All over two. Now we're back to that first warm up question, aren't we? 124 could be simplified out. Now let's think about this. What do you guys reckon goes into 124? Uh, perfect squares. Four goes in. I kind of have a sneaky suspicion that maybe maybe 16 goes in, but no, alas, four times 31. So it's just going to be four. Right? Four times 31. Uh, so this is the square root of four times 31. So that's going to be what? Two square root of 31. So 10 plus or minus two square root of 31. All over two. Now, can I leave my answer like this? Please say no. Why not? What about the plus or minus? OK, so you want me to split it? Um, OK, we could split it. We could say. 10 plus 2 radical 31 over 2, and that would still be bad. Not the radical. The fraction can be simplified. What is a common factor on the top of that fraction? 2. 
So if I take out a two from the top, it can cancel with the two on the bottom, right? But I have to take the two out from both of those terms. So I'm going to take it out from the 10 and from the radical. So this winds up being five plus or minus the square root of 31. Again, reason being is that if we went over here to this and let's say we uh, wrote it up a little bit bigger, 10 plus two square root of 31 all over two, I could factor out a two, right? And then those twos cancel out. Remember, you can only cancel common factors, not terms. Sometimes students mistakenly will kill off the two here, and the two here, but they'll leave the 10 as is. Can't do that roadblock. OK, so five plus or minus the square root of 31 winds up being our solution. Uh, for this problem. All right now, uh, Quinn mentioned another technique besides the quadratic formula that we should apply here on part B. What technique is that? It's already complete. The square root method. So completing the square is like part one of that process, and then, then the square root method is part two. Well, they've already completed the square force, so now all we need to do is just take the square root of both sides, right? No. no. We'll get the... Why don't we add one to both sides first before we take the square root? Right? So if I add one to both sides, I got x plus three quantity squared equals 20. Now you and I just got through talking about how we're, we've got these pairs of inverse operations like plus minus, multiply, divide. We've got now logarithms and exponents. Warning, trick question, warning, trick question. So I see an exponent right here, so I must need to take the log of both sides, right? Why not? When should I take the log of both sides? When the variable is where? in the exponent. If the variable is in the exponent, that's when it would be appropriate to consider logarithms. Where's the variable on this one, Santiago? It's down low, baby. So I don't need to take the log of both sides. I need to do what? I need to take the square root of both sides. To undo a square, we take the square root. Now, Nick Pesci. Ooh, it's a tough question. You ready? When I take this, did you say no? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought he was like, no. When I take the square root of both sides, these guys cancel out, so I'm left with x plus 3. What do I have to remember when I take the square root of both sides to put over here? Remember, by the way, that this is a quadratic equation, and as Joseph said a minute ago, quadratic equations have two solutions. Um, absolute value. Not absolute value. We skip over that step. Plus or minus sign. Plus or minus sign. Very good. And that reminds us... Uh, back up there in red, remember, our quadratic formula has a plus or minus sign in it. So we remember that with the quadratic formula or with completing the square and the square root method, a plus or minus is necessary. All right, Luke, what do you see in the square root of 20 that you'd like to take out? Square root of 20 could be written as what? Four and five. So if the square root of 20 is the same thing as 4 times 5, square root of 4 times 5, we could split that up as square root of 4 and square root of 5, or 2 and square root of 5. So we got 2 and square root of 5 there. And then what would my last step need to be? Your x is almost by itself. Subtract 3 from both sides. So x equals negative 3 plus or minus 2 square root of 5. All right. Not too bad, not too bad. So as far as those warm ups go, uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, let's get, first of all, let's get questions, Santiago. Would you be saying we only got plus or minus for the quadratic? So whenever you use quadratic formula or uh, the square root method, like when I take, I think I asked Pesci this, I said, when I take the square root of both sides, what do I need to remember? And initially he said absolute value, which he's correct, but, but then we move past the absolute value step. We skip over that step. We say, oh yeah, put a tack on a plus or minus. All right, now here's what I want us to do. Give yourself a score out of four, okay? This is just for your own edification. I'm not taking up 
any kind of work or, or numbers or anything like that. But just mentally say, mm, oh, I screwed the pooch on that one. I was one for four. You know, give yourself a, a little check and say, man, I got work to do on this. I'm weak on, let's say, simplifying radicals or solving quadratics. And if that's the case, brother, start practicing. We hadn't talked about it in a few months, maybe a couple months. So get back in the swing of it. Okay. Because these topics, I'm telling you, I talk to Mr. Perry all the time. These topics will hit you upside the head as you come in the door of geometry next year. Okay. And you want to do well. I want you guys to succeed. So any questions that you've got remaining over the warm-ups? Monday morning, kicking you guys in the booty. I love it. That's why they pay me the big bucks. All right. Is it really? I turned the air down because I was hot. I'll, I'll hit it back to normal. Now, on the screen, speaking of geometry, I got a bunch of review from middle school math. And I, I don't like to assume anything as far as what students have, have got have learned uh, you know, in middle school. So I say this is a review for middle school math. And, and yet I'm going to assume that you guys don't know any of this. And so I want you to write it down. So in this lesson, this lesson is all about the Pythagorean theorem, if you haven't noticed that yet. Uh, and so in this lesson, we're going to be talking about triangles. Uh, Hogan, start writing, please. Uh, we're going to talk about triangles, all right? So again, I, no offense to anybody. Love you, JT. No offense. Uh, I'm going to assume you guys don't know anything, okay? So first of all, a triangle has how many sides? Three sides. Duh. Okay, we're starting easy. Uh, a triangle has how many interior angles? interior angles. That's not a coincidence, okay? A polygon will have a matching number of sides and interior angles, okay? Now, Nick, what specific kind of triangle is this? Very good. Now, how did you know that, and why did you call it a right triangle? Well, because there's a little square right there, and I know that's a 90 degree. Beautiful. Well said right there. Angle C with a capital C, that's the right angle. So we call this a right triangle. There are other types of triangles. We call them acute and obtuse. Okay. Those are names that we use to refer to a triangle based on its angles. What are the names that we use to refer to a triangle based on its sides? Isosceles is a triangle where there are exactly two congruent sides. Equilateral, I knew somebody was going to come up with it. Equilateral triangle is a triangle wherein there are exactly three congruent sides. By the way, an equilateral triangle will always have an interior measure angle of 60 degrees, 60, 60, 60. Uh, and then we call it when it's a, Luke called it a regular triangle. What do you call it when none of the sides are congruent? Scalene. Very good, Justin. Scalene and triangle. All right, so anyway. Right, am I ringing the bell? Is this thing that you guys have heard before? Or are y'all like, I never heard that word in my life? All right, good. So what we're doing right now is we're leveling the playing field. This is nice. Now, in a right triangle, let's get back to the topic at hand here. In a right triangle, there is exactly one 90-degree angle. A degree, by the way, is a unit of measure by which we measure angles. And a degree is one 360th of a circle. Of a, so like if I spin around one full revolution, I have spun around 360 degrees. So if you take that number, 360, which is a very nice number, by the way, it's divisible by a lot of things. Uh, it's divisible by one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, 10, 12, 15, 18, 20, it's, it's divisible by a buttload of stuff, uh, which is one of the reasons why they used it. Another reason why they used it is they used to think that the year was 360 days long. Uh, but I digress. You don't need to know the history of mathematics. You just need to know that one degree is one 360th, in other words, a tiny little sliver of that full 
rotation revolution around, okay? And therefore, 90 degrees is a quarter of a revolution. Good, a fourth. Somebody said a fourth of a revolution. So 90 degrees, a right angle. Nick, question. Uh, what is the, there's a Scalene. S-C-A-L-E-N-E. -E. Scalene. And that just means there's no congruency between the sides. So, um, let's see. We talked about degrees. Okay. Oh, uh, we used legs to refer to the two sides that emanate from the right angle. That's what we call the legs. And then we call the hypotenuse the side that emanates across from the right angle. So uh, the typical nomenclature for a triangle is capital A, capital B, capital C. We use capital letters conventionally to name the angles and lowercase letters to name the sides. Okay, I made that mention in green there. Hopefully you wrote that down. So we would call the hypotenuse in this case little c. We'd call the two legs little a, cross from big A, and little b, cross from big B. Uh, conventionally speaking, that's how we name the angles and the sides of a triangle. That doesn't mean that we can't break convention and say, I'm going to name this triangle XYZ or JFK or RST or LNE or whatever it is. Okay. Uh, but conventionally, typically we'll see ABC being used there. Now, let's get to the bullet points up there. The largest side is across from the largest angle. That should be common sense. As I spread my hands apart, the angle is getting bigger and the distance between my fingertips is getting bigger. That's common sense. As I move closer together, the angle is getting smaller and consequently the distance between my fingertips is getting smaller. So the biggest side is across from the biggest angle. Now, what is the biggest possible angle in a right triangle? In a right triangle, the biggest possible angle will always be that 90 degrees. To William's point, because the sum of the three angles inside add up to 180, and I have to have three angles. So if one angle uses 90 of those degrees, I've only got 90 degrees left to go between two angles. And I have to split it up. Even if I split it up like 89.9 and 0.1, those are still less than 90 degrees. And so my right angle would therefore be my biggest side, uh, biggest angle across from which would be the biggest side. So we call the hypotenuse the biggest side. It's across from the 90 degree angle. Um, let's see here. Smallest size cross from the smallest angle. All right. Any questions over what you see on your screen right here? You feel a little bit better now. Maybe the playing field is getting leveled. Be honest. How many of you uh, already knew everything on that screen? Okay. Okay. Good. So if I rolled up in here and assumed that you all knew that, we wouldn't be. It, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be fair. So now everybody's good. Everybody remembers that. Uh, and then I asked this big question down here at the right. Who could quote for me the Pythagorean theorem? Warning, I'm probably going to yell at you. Uh, Ashton, go ahead. Well, you tell me, son. You're the one that's going to raise your hand and say you know it. Be bold. Be brave. You're pretty dead close. I'm not going to yell at you because you did a good, a good job, William. Do you feel like getting yelled at? Okay, go ahead. What's up? Thank you, there. No, it's not a squared plus b squared equals c squared. <laughs> I got to yell at somebody. Okay, good. Now, what's real common is I always, I always try to get that answer. Thank you, William, for giving me what I want. Uh, it's very uncommon to get the answer that Ashton gave me. So, a little smattery for Ashton. A little smattery. Okay. Here's, here's the thing. Ashton used some good terminology. He said one leg squared plus one leg squared equals the hypotenuse squared. Therefore, that implies what kind of triangle are we dealing with? A right triangle. Good. When we say, and, and again, I know what William means, and I'm not busting William's job. When we just say a squared plus b squared equals c squared, who the dump knows what a, b, and c are? Okay. That relationship, a squared plus b squared plus c squared, doesn't mean jack squat because you don't identify what a, b, and c are. So <clears throat> the Pythagorean theorem is an if-then statement. And a lot of times students only know the then. They only know what's called the conclusion. Can we write this down, please? They only know the conclusion. Next year, when you take geometry, 
you guys will be working with a lot of if then statements. OK, you'll be learning logic. Whether you go to Mr. Perry's or Coach Smith's class, you'll be learning logic. You'll be learning things like um, this is a if then statement. So what's the quote converse of it? Or what's the contrapositive of it? Or what's the opposite? Of, and, and you need to understand it's in this case, this is what we call the hypothesis. And this is what we call the conclusion. So the hypothesis sets the table. That's the what Ashton said. Hey, psst, you got a right triangle here or whether he implied that. OK, and then I have the conclusion that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Another way of phrasing it is at, as as we say down here, the sum of the squares of the legs of a right triangle equals the square of the hypotenuse. And then we can do, I think Ashton alluded to this also, we can do a lot of neat stuff with the Pythagorean theorem, a lot. There are a bunch of applications. But Pythagoras is a great example of an if then statement. If is the hypothesis, then is the conclusion. It gets the ball rolling. And did you know this is actually how they used to line football fields, or at least some coaches would use this? Um, they would, you know, like before you had a turf field that's always lined, uh, a football coach, like they would mow the grass. Like, Christ, you know this from watching Coach Smith and I do this. Uh, like, we line the baseball field. We go down, we string up a, a long string from home plate down to the fence, and then we, we've got a chalker that we line chalk with, and we got a spray paint machine where we just push it and we can keep the line straight and we spray paint. That's what that's what people used to do for football fields. Could you imagine doing that on a deck of football field with all the lines and all the hash marks and stuff? Um, now, now this the way that I do it at baseball is with like a little hand thing. It's an old janky thing. You usually actually just squeeze the trigger and it sprays spray paint. When I was in high school, we had a machine that would do it. That would literally like you see something painting lines on a road outside like that's we had a, a machine like you pull crank it. You pour in a five gallon bucket of paint. And, and it would it would stay on a straight line. But the idea is how do they set the angle in the end zone? A lot of times football coaches would measure out. They'd measure out three feet in one direction. They'd measure out four feet in another direction. And then they had a five foot uh, piece of wood that they would make sure hit right here and here. And then they knew that this was a right angle. Right. Good application of Pythagoras. Um, and, and it's actually an illustration. I used the word converse a moment ago. It's actually an illustration of what is called the converse. In your notes, write down that the word converse means you just switch the hypothesis and the conclusion. Look here. Now it says if a squared plus b squared equals c squared, then you've got a what? A right triangle. So that football coach is looking for that 90 degree angle. He says, man, if I can get it to where one leg is three, one leg is four, and the other, the hypotenuse is five, then, because three squared plus four squared equals five squared, I don't know if you guys knew that, uh, then uh, I've got myself a 90 degree angle, and I'm good to go on my, my angle uh, from my end zone. And once you get that set, everything's good. It's like the cornerstone of a building used to be. Luke, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. That's a labor of love, boys. Let me tell you, that's a labor of love. William. So converse is when you take a, a theorem, an if-then statement, and you just watch my hands. You just switch the hypothesis and the conclusion. So like what's in red is, is called the Pythagorean theorem, and what's in green is the converse of the Pythagorean theorem. So converse just means you switch the hypothesis and the conclusion. William. Great question. It does not matter. Those are dummy variables. They stand in place. You could call it X, Y, Z, R, S, T, L, and E, whatever. By the way, speaking of R, S, T, L, and E, did you guys see on the Wheel of Fortune the other day? Somebody want a house? My, my parents watch it like every night. Um, and so I told you guys we spent, the, we spent the night with my mom and dad Thursday and Friday and, and uh, all day Saturday. So we watched Wheel of Fortune a couple of times. Uh, they had a guy, went, I don't know if it's a guy or not, they had a guy or a gal uh, earlier last week that won a freaking house on Wheel of Fortune. Was it like a rerun? Or? No, like a, like a new episode. Pat Sajak and Vanna White, baby. Hey, I auditioned to be on uh, Wheel of Fortune one time. Did I tell you guys that? No, I didn't even get up. The way that they would do it is they, they had a casting call, 
Um, and so you, I drove down to Tupelo, Mississippi, to the Bancorp South Center. And there's probably like 5,000 people down there. We waited in line. This might have been when I was uh, probably about 20 years old. Uh, so you waited in line, and then they set you down in the arena, like like the, the let's say like the end zone of the arena. They set you down in the, the back part of there, and they had a, a stage, and they had a, the, they had a host, uh, and had a short, small little wheel, and they would call up five contestants at a time. They would spin the wheel, and they would play a real quick um, uh, puzzle, and and then they would say, all right, thanks very much, and then they'd call up five more, and they'd call up five more. And so I sat down there for two hours, and they never called my name to get up on stage to try it. I was like, oh, man. But it was kind of entertaining to watch. Uh, but that's how they get their contestants, is that they'll say, if it's somebody that's good at the game, somebody that's entertaining, has a neat backstory, we'll get them on there. Uh, so you never know, man. You never know. Hey, uh, our, I think our time is up. we got about a minute left. So why don't we call it quits for today? Real good class, fellas. We'll pick up with some examples tomorrow. And in the meantime, check your Delta map. Make sure that you haven't missed any assignments recently. And uh, I'll put up your ACT quiz, uh, ACT practice quiz uh, this morning. And live Jesus in our hearts. All right. Will Perone, I'll see you, buddy. Hope you feel better. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs>